It's always a treat when uh, a board meeting for the Rafiki Foundation, which serves folks in Africa, brings me to Central Florida. I get to visit the Gates family, and I get to worship with all of you. And it's a special privilege uh, when Pastor David and the elders invite me to bring the word to you. So I'm looking forward to this. Um, we are looking back into the Old Testament today, to Joshua chapter 4, uh, an event that took place over a thousand years before Jesus was born. This is in the midst of when God is bringing the people of Israel, uh, who 40 years earlier left Egypt um, under the leadership of Moses, and God set them free. Uh, but then they've been in the wilderness for about 40 years, and actually the adults who left with Moses have died because of their unbelief. They didn't believe that God could bring them into the land. But now their children have grown up, and they're about to be brought into the home that God had promised to their ancestors long ago, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we hear now from chapter 4, the crossing of the Jordan River. So please, if you can, stand with me as we hear God speak to us through his word. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priests' feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in time to come, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. For the priests bearing the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. The people passed over in haste. And when all the people had finished passing over, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people. The sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000, ready for war, passed over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they stood in awe of him, just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, Command the priests bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priests, Come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up on dry ground. The waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones, which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, What do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you now to really open our hearts to this word that shows how mighty you are. Even here in this place, we represent all the peoples of the earth from many, many different backgrounds. And we know that you've spoken this word and you gave this great event to Abraham's biological children long ago so that we too might know that you are mighty and we might become Abraham's children by trusting in Jesus, the great son of Abraham, and receiving rescue and homecoming through him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Intergenerational amnesia. Wow, that's a big phrase. I don't know if I've ever heard it before, but it's a problem. Intergenerational amnesia. Over generations, things tend to get lost or forgotten. I was reminded that a couple of weeks ago when my wife and I went to our local Barnes & Noble, as we sometimes do for a date. Exciting date, right? We're book people. Uh, and on one of the sale tables up front, there was a book, I don't even remember the title actually, it wasn't Intergenerational Amnesia, but I flipped open to a page that compared three generations. Uh, the great generation, uh, the generation that fought courageously for our country during World War II and came back and worked hard and uh, moved to the suburbs and raised their children, the boomers, that's the second generation, that's us, uh, who devoted our early adult years to protesting and rebellion and basically materialism. And then later generations, Gen X, millennials, and so on. And, and, and the author just talked about those three generations, the courage and discipline giving way to the rebellion and self-indulgence, and then the younger generation, our kids, often being very insecure and sometimes cynical. Now, those are big generalizations, and there are many, many exceptions, but there's probably enough to those characterizations that something was lost from one generation to the next. Intergenerational amnesia. Uh, I'll give you another uh, more home close to home example, it's very humbling. My grandfather came from Sweden early in the 20th century, a uh, master woodworker, carpenter, contractor, built houses uh, in the LA basin, Los Angeles for a number of uh, decades. My dad, one of his jobs was to inspect houses because he learned about how houses are supposed to be put together from his father. And my dad did beautiful woodworking, a lot of different projects. We have a mantle in our house and bookcases and other things that he's made and um, beautiful little jewelry boxes. I think each member of our family has loved woodworking. And then there's my brother and me. <clears throat> And I know that my dad, in, as we were growing up, spent many Saturdays, his days off, out in the garage working on wood. Uh, but somehow that didn't seem fun to us. Uh, and so when I have needed more bookshelves and had to put my own together, uh, not from fine walnut like he would do, but with cheap pine, I wished I'd paid more attention and spent more Saturday mornings with my dad. Generational, intergenerational amnesia. Well... We can smile at that. It's more serious when it comes to spiritual things. Uh, and the history of Israel, and actually the history of, of beyond Israel, but certainly we read it in the Bible, where people tend to forget generation after generation what God has done. It isn't, play, it isn't laid down and, and placed onto children's hearts and grandchildren's hearts from generation to generation. And so God does this wonderful thing. He embeds in his people's life experience Reminders, memorials, this pile of memory stones is, is one of those. Actually, the early books of the Bible record three times when something like the script that we heard here with a prop or an occasion leads children to ask, what is this all about? And parents to give the answer, to pass it along to the next generation. We're going to look in just a couple minutes at the other two, the earlier two, both associated with Moses. But that's what God is doing here. He's helping Israel to remember as a people because they'd forgotten. Certainly the, the generation of their parents had forgotten. They had seen the mighty ten plagues that 
brought is Egypt to its knees and they'd seen God lead them out through the dried waters of the Red Sea as is referenced here at the end of our text and they their parents had seen God provide bread every morning the manna and supply their thirst with water from the rock but by the time they had gotten 40 years earlier to Kadesh and about were ready to enter the land and 10 spies out of the 12 came back and said well it's good land but we could never conquer it God's not strong enough to give it to us only two said God will give it to us Joshua was one of those two well their parents having forgotten all they had seen said oh we can't and so they spent the next four decades until their children had grown up and all that generation had died but now the children are grown up and they're ready to go into the land and uh, and God says I want to take I want you to take some stones out of the middle of the Jordan River and a pile of stones that you will erect in the middle of the riverbed while it's still dry and it will be a, mem a, a memorial of memory stones to engender conversations between parents and children it's an event worth remembering given to a people who tend to forget and therefore God gives the memorial that keeps on reminding so that's that's what we're going to look at today an event worth remembering I actually our family has an event for, worth remembering and we have a, a memory stone from it this is probably a little too small for you to see but there it is on the screen what this is actually is a bolt you can sort of see that it's sheared off at the top it still has a lug nut attached it along with four of its companions were supposed to hold the right rear tire of a Chevy Malibu station wagon on as we were driving on Christmas Eve in the 1990s north from the San Diego area to LA to have have Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with my family and we were in the fast lane so I was going the speed limit of course exactly 65 not 66 not 67 just 65 and suddenly with a bang a head cop a hubcap flew off and it felt like we had a flat tire so fast lane I had to pull it was a nice wide median at that point I pulled into the wide median turned off the car got out to look for the flat tire and every tire was perfectly inflated no problem until I looked again at the right rear tire and there were no bolts and lug nuts holding that tire to the rear axle the last two had dropped right beside where we parked so they were just sitting there in the road I picked them both up I've lost one but I got one so hitched a ride up to the next town tow truck driver came back down took one look at the car and what had happened he said hmm, last time I saw this happen the tire had wedged up in the wheel well had dragged on the whole car and flipped the whole car in its roof Wow as the driver said with great theology wow you were really lucky <laughs> and I did have the presence of mind to say no no God was looking out for us I actually think I said you know actually Jesus gave us this as his birthday present to us since we were to celebrate Christmas um, and so we all piled in the cab got the car up on the bed of the truck and dropped it off my dad came down picked us up and uh, we had you know the, the worst thing for the day was Christmas Eve dinner which for Swedes is a big thing was about three hours late a memory stone God watched over us now that's one family but God has embedded memory stones into the life of Israel for the whole family of God so that every time they went by this place they would see that stack of boulders on the west bank of the Jordan and maybe if they came by in the late summer or early fall after the long dry season I know summer in Florida is not the long dry season but Israel is more like California we know long dry seasons that go from well from June into October and we're longing for rain maybe to come in November December maybe at low stream the Jordan they might see the top of that pillar of stones in the in the riverbed too the author does say here doesn't he it, they are there to this day so that must be his clue to say now if you come by when the river is low 
in the late fall, you might get to see the top of the stones. God puts that, it's a, an event worth remembering because it's the rescue of God's people. Actually, it's more than the rescue. It's their, it's their homecoming, in a sense. The other two places in the books of Moses, just before Joshua, where we have this little script where the kids say, what's this all about? And the parents give an answer. Our first Passover which reminded Israel about the exodus, actually the night before the exodus, when their children were spared, when death came through Egypt and the firstborn of Egypt suffered the punishment of sin and died. So the Passover, which they were to observe every year, and if you read in Exodus 12, you find that God says there, when you have this meal, when you kill the lamb, when you spread its blood on the doorposts and the lintel of your houses, when you eat the, the lamb with the matzah, with the unleavened bread, and, and with the bitter herbs, and you remember your slavery, but you also remember God spared you from death and brought you to freedom, your kids are going to ask, what is all this about? And you tell them, we were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out into freedom. And the second time this script is prescribed in the early books of the Bible is in Deuteronomy 6. When the Lord has given the great, great commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength, with everything that's in you, and then take these commands and write them on your own heart and on your doors and, and tell them to your children, morning, evening, noon, night, inside, outside. Your kids are going to say, what's with all the commands? What are all these instructions about? And again, what's the answer going to be? We were slaves, and God brought us out by his power and his grace, and now he's given us these laws to live by, to use our freedom and our gratitude well. And now he's bringing us into a land that he's going to give to us. So he's provided for us freedom from death, freedom from slavery, guidelines to live, and now we have the homecoming. They're coming home. Now, of course, none of these people have ever seen this home before. Right? I mean, the last time anybody had been of this family back in the Promised Land was, uh, I suppose, when they went, no, that was even, when they went to bury Jacob, actually, because I think Joseph died in Egypt, and he said, centuries from now, you're going to be able to go home and take my bones. So they didn't even go back for Joseph's, uh, for Joseph's funeral. That, it, so it's been generations, and they've not been home, but this is their home. This is the place to be safe. Of course, it's not really safe in this world. It's no more safe than Orlando, listening over on the drive over here about the shootings last night. And one of the radio commentators were saying, we like to think of Orlando as the happiest place on earth. Hmm, not so much. Not a safe place. Not a safe place. And, uh, but it's a picture. Palestine, that is Canaan, the promised land was a picture of a home, a new heavens and a new earth that God is going to bring his people to, is bringing his people to. So this was an event worth remembering. It was an event in which God showed his power. Uh, you maybe noticed the, the slight mention there that this happened in the first month. That's not January on their calendar. It's Nisan, which comes, uh, not, the, not the car, okay? The Hebrew word Nisan, which comes in the spring. It's the month in which the Passover is observed. In fact, four days after this, they would have, should have been observing the Passover four days later. And it's the rainy season. So the Jordan is not only at full flow, but it's overflowing its banks. You heard that when finally the Jordan was released, it overflowed its banks. Nobody could get across the Jordan River this time of year unless it was an act of God. And it certainly was. An event worth remembering. But actually that event isn't the best event. Because people who had been freed from slavery and preserved in the desert and even now brought into the homeland weren't necessarily free. They were still potentially enslaved. In fact, two chapters later, we're going to read about a man, we won't today, but you can read about a man uh, named Achan, 
uh, who was still enslaved with the love of stuff to the point where when God said, when this Jericho's destroyed, it's all mine. Destroy it all. And Achan said, I can get away with just a few things. I'll hide for security. It's still dangerous. It's still a dangerous place. What we need is freedom from the enslavement of our own hearts, our own heart's desires. And that's why this event is pointing to the great homecoming event, and that's when Christ comes to bring his people home. But more about that in a minute. Because we do need to note why God gives memorials like this, memory stones like this, uh, for Israel in the Old Testament. He'd given stones earlier. Jacob had erected a stone at what was called Luz, but now it's going to be called Bethel, house of God, because God appeared to him there. Later on, Samuel would erect a stone which he called Eben Ezer. We glum it together to Ebenezer. Um, it, one of the verses of Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, which we did not sing today, says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither I by, I, by thy help I've come. Uh, I don't think we use that verse so much anymore because people think Ebenezer and they think the Christmas carol and Scrooge. But Ebenezer is the Bible term for stone of help. And God knew that his people would forget. Actually, just weeks or months before they crossed the Jordan, Moses had been delivering sermons to them on the plains of Moab. We call it the book of Deuteronomy. And Moses had said to them in Deuteronomy chapter 8, there are going to be dangers ahead. There, you're going to be, there are going to be enemy forces. There are going to be pagan gods that other people worship. Don't worship them. And there's also the danger of your own success and prosperity. Both are dangers. And I think that's true probably for us too. Sometimes we're tempted to forget the Lord when we see really big problems, even though he's provided for us in the past. I have to tell you the other half of the story about the lug nut and the bolt and the memory stone. The Lord watched over us, kept us safe. We had a nice Christmas. We borrowed one of my folks' cars, drove back to our home near San Diego. And, of course, our real car, our car, was kind of stranded up in a town called Coronado, 50 miles north of us. And I was on the phone with the repair shops, and they were saying, well... We're having trouble getting those sheared off bolts out of the brake drum. We're going to have to maybe pull the whole axle apart. Here's my estimate. And I thought, that's way more than this car is worth. Way more. So since I borrowed my mom's car, I was on the phone with my mom and lamenting how our life was ruined because my car wasn't close to home. Uh, and I was teaching already at Westminster. I'd been a pastor for a while, but now I was teaching, so I'm training pastors, and I'm at a good, solid school that knows that God is sovereign. And I'm telling my mom about what's to become of us, sort of. Uh, and I don't remember my words, but I remember my mom's words. She said, now, Dan. I never taught her to call me Dr. Johnson. <laughs> mom can call, now, Dan. The Lord has these things in control, you know. That was supposed to be my line, right? I'm a theologian, uh, but she was right. So sometimes the problems can lead us to forget. Remember, remember last Christ Christmas Eve just a few days ago when the Lord protected your family from death, perhaps, or injury? No, I'd forgotten. Sometimes we do that, right? The Lord watches over us, and then, and then something new happens, and the bills come due, or whatever it might be, and and we forget. But we're also tempted to forget when things go well. And actually that was the more serious warning that Moses gave to the Israelites. He says in Deuteronomy 8, he says, take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have good houses and live in them, when your, hearts, when your herds and your flocks multiply, then your heart might be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. No, you shall remember the Lord your God. That's what we need to do. We need reminders of that. And that's why God, for us too, 
not just for an individual family with a bolt and a lug nut, but for all of us as God's people. God embeds memory stones into our experience. He says to us, celebrate my son's resurrection from the dead every single first day of the week. Come together on this day that I've made the Lord's day. In your calendar, this is a memory stone week by week to keep reminding you of God's faithfulness. And when we have baptism, receiving a covenant child, or maybe someone who's come to faith later on in life and come into the covenant family of God, that's a memory stone. And when we observe the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup are memory stones. Jesus says, do this in memory of me. Now, it's more than just us remembering when we have the Lord's Supper, for sure. Jesus is present by his Holy Spirit here. And he's preaching the gospel to us, not just through our ears as we hear now, but through our hands and our eyes and our taste buds. He is bringing grace to us in the supper. But it is an occasion for us to remember. These are monuments that go on reminding. And the, the memory stones by and in the Jordan certainly were that. Because did you notice how they were to pick out the boulders? The boulders, both the ones that were going to be built into the little pile on the west bank and the one in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the riverbed, were to come from where the feet of the priests stood, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. It was pretty repetitive in that chapter. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. That ark was the holiest piece of the furniture of the tabernacle. It was the golden chest in which there were mementos of God's providing for Israel in the wilderness on the inside. And then on the top, two golden statues of cherubim. cherubim. Don't think of fat little pudgy angels. Think of awesome guardians of the holiness of God facing inward toward the throne of God. But on the throne, no statue, because the living God couldn't be represented by anything that human beings could make to copy out of anything on the face of the earth. The living God would become visible in flesh and blood. Jesus, the image of God, becomes our human brother in the fullness of time. But the throne was empty, in a sense. But the point was, this is God's throne. The God who lives in heaven comes down and lives among his people and... and and this is the place where God stands and says to the Jordan, stop. And it stops upstream. And on dry ground, all of his people come through. And the connection that you heard at the end of Joshua 4 between the Red Sea 40 years earlier and the Jordan River is a connection that psalmists, at least one psalmist in the Bible makes as well, Psalm 114. He says, the sea looked and fled Jordan turned back. So there's Red Sea and Jordan. What ails you, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. God who lives in unimaginable glory beyond our universe comes down and he lives among his people and he stopped the water right there. And that's what made those stones so significant because they were virtually under feet of the priests who were carrying the throne of God. God fighting for his people against the threat of the flood. But there's something more. The Ark of the Covenant, at this point, if they were following the rules that God had given to Moses, and I assume that maybe at this point they were, would have been covered over by a, a large tarp, uh, a large covering curtain. Uh, as it was, whenever they had to break up camp and move, uh, when the Lord said, it's time to move out in those last 40 years, it was covered over. And only when the tabernacle was set up again, and it's two chambers, the outer chamber, holy place, and inner chamber, most holy place, and then the ark brought in, only then was it uncovered. Because only one person could see that golden throne of God, and only once a year. The high priest, Aaron, and then his sons in succession could go in only on the Day of Atonement. And first they had to carry in the blood of a bull 
to atone for their own sin, and then they would carry in the blood of a goat to atone for the sin of Israel. And then they would leave. They went in with fear and trembling to stand before the presence of God. So though Israel couldn't see it, they knew from having heard the books of Moses read that there was something on that gold mercy seat, that place of atonement. There were blood stains. There were 40 years of dried blood because nobody could wipe off those blood stains once they'd been sprinkled on the ark. It was too holy to touch. Blood stains there to signal that the way into home for us had to be bought by the blood of a flawless sacrifice. Of course, it couldn't be bulls, couldn't be goats, couldn't be any animal. It had to be human blood to atone for human sin. And you know whose blood it was, right? The blood of goats, the blood of bulls, the blood of lambs on the Passover time, all pointing forward to when God the Son becomes our human brother and obeys the law perfectly so he doesn't deserve to die ever at all. But he goes to death and his blood is shed for us. And you see that ark and the stones that come from under the feet of that ark is saying, this is what this is the price God has paid to bring you home. It's the price he paid to make you free in the Exodus. It's the price he's paid to bring you home to a place that will be safe forever, a new heavens and a new earth where there's no more shootings and no more weeping and no more sorrow. And you see what it's all for. Very last verse. You see what it's all for? The Lord... Verse 23 says, The Lord dried up the waters of the Jordan as he dried up the Red Sea so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God. My bolt and lug nut mean a lot to the Johnson family. Well, to Dan Gates, too. He would have to be married to somebody else, maybe. <laughs> But they're pretty little. And these stones, which would occasion that conversation when dad and son were going by on the West Bank and the son says, what's with the boulders? Or maybe mom and daughter are going by and it's in September and the, and the, the ebb is low enough and they can see also the boulders in the middle of the Jordan. And what's this about? And they talk about God's power. But it's not just for Israel, see? It's not just for the biological children of Abraham. It's for all the peoples of the earth to know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. It's for you and it's for me. It's for you who are Christians and know that God is your God, that this God has paid the price of the blood of his own son to bring you out of slavery into freedom, out of death into life, and ultimately will bring you home through the blood of Jesus. And if, if you're not a Christian here today, it's wonderful that you're here. You may have been assuming, whatever, whatever brings you here, you may have been assuming that God was no more interested in you than you are in him up to this point. But in fact, this is good news. God is interested in all the peoples of the earth. Not just one family, not just one clan, not just one nation, but he's interested in all kinds of people. And he wants all kinds of people to come home to him. And he's given his lifeblood, his son's lifeblood for you. So it's a wonderful invitation to us. These, these memory stones, it's an invitation to us to rest and trust in Jesus and a calling to us to get the word out to others, to friends and neighbors and co-workers and the guy driving the tow truck. Um, I wish I'd said more than God was taking care of us, but that's water under the bridge. Pardon the Jordan illusion there. Um, but to be alert because God wants all kinds of people to come to know him. Uh, and certainly to take every occasion to pass along the word to our children. Because God has a remedy for our intergenerational spiritual amnesia. He wants us to pass along the word to our kids as well as to let it be known to all the nations of the earth. Praise God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your large heart as well as your mighty arm. We stand in awe uh, at uh, 
your power to stop the flow of the Jordan River at flood stage in the spring, in the first month when the waters were flowing at top and beyond the banks. But we stand even more in awe at the power you displayed in the weakness of the cross of Christ. That through that death in disgrace and under your judgment, which Jesus did not deserve, but we do, in that death you have brought us out of death and into life and you've secured for us a place in that new heavens and earth, a homeland where there will be no more enemies, no more bloodshed, no more sorrow. Father, call your people in from all the peoples of the world through the good news of your grace in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. <laughs>